There is an immense amount of material that a preacher could unpack from the Leviticus reading and from Corinthians and from the reading from the gospel. And I don't know whether to thank or send a terse note to Patrick for giving me that task today. <laughs> it seems like about every three or four weeks there's a set of lessons that are a doozy, so to speak. And that's when the guy who's only here part of the year, like me, gets it. <laughs> and, well, let's just cut to the chase. Loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you is a verse in the Bible that I just wish it wasn't there. <laughs> it's a tall order, to say the least. It is not easy to hear it today, and it could not have been easy when Jesus preached it as part of the Sermon on the Mount. His original audience would have said, oh, love your neighbor as yourself, comes from Leviticus, what we know as chapter 19. We heard it read this morning. It doesn't actually say anything about anyone else. It talks about loving your neighbors. And by the time of Jesus' mission among us, by the time of his preaching this Sermon on the Mount, there had been a little addition to that. There was a whole oral tradition, a bunch of non-scriptural but nevertheless highly venerated teachings that circulated among the ancient Jewish people. And one of them was the, the, the quotation that he comes up with and says, you've heard it said, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Not written down, but very current in the day. And eventually recorded in, the, in what the, we know as the Talmud, that whole body of Jewish wisdom teaching. And Jesus just looks at that and dismantles it. This whole portion of the Sermon on the Mount is a dismantling, an expansion, a clarification, and a tightening down. Because Jesus is going one more step. You've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said, but I say to you. And the but I say to you here is, love your neighbors, yes, but... Love those who are your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hating enemies is human nature. Although it's learned behavior, we probably begin our lives trusting a great deal, but we learn pretty soon and from any number of teachers uh, that our enemies are not our friends, they're not to be trusted, and making that jump from not our friends, not to be trusted, into subtly or overtly hating someone is not all that difficult. We have teachers of this in our current generation. I would think that this sermon, this verse, this part of the sermon, not these unworthy words today, but the sermon that Jesus speaks could probably be useful in any number of places before any number of meetings. Can you imagine not only here in this pulpit hearing those words, but maybe as the introduction to a city council meeting? Or maybe at the diocesan council of the Diocese of West Texas that meets in Corpus Christi next week? Or how about before the next White House news conference? <laughs> maybe at the United Nations, maybe any place in between. I think in every possible place that we can imagine, there are ears that need to hear. I am preaching to myself this morning and to the handful of other people here who have trouble loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. We are naturally good at loving people who are like us. And then, just as among the ancient chosen people, then there's everyone else. So if you really want to get to the bottom of what Jesus is talking about when he speaks about loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you, you need to know something about love and the Greek language. I know a little about love and very little about Greek, but I did my research. And you know, love comes in four different flavors in Greek. It's a uh, way better off than English, where we have one word. We say love, 
for everything from loving malted milk bowls and chocolate ice cream up to loving your spouse, loving your neighbor, and loving God. It's all the same word, and we understand what we're talking about because we know the context, but the Greeks were better, and they had four ways of putting it. There is the first kind of love that is the kind of natural love that is in a family, the natural love that mothers and fathers have for their children most of the time. <laughs> then there is the passionate and the romantic kind of love which this sermon is not about. <laughs> then there is the brotherly love, as in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that kind that is between friends. It's the deepest and most giving kind of human-level friendship that there is, the kind that exists between people who deeply respect each other and will do anything for each other. That's, that's filial love, Philadelphia. And then there is the fourth kind, the kind that always seeks for and desires the very best, the very highest possible result for everyone all the time. And that's the love that Jesus is talking about. Unfortunately, that's the level of love that he's calling forth in us. When he says that love your neighbor as yourself, he's saying you've got to love them not in the first three ways, not in the ones that arise out of human experience and come from the heart. You've got to love with an act of the will that directs your love out as intensely and as un unremittingly and as completely as it is that God gives sunshine and rain to everyone, which is how he illustrates what this love is like. God gives rain and sunshine to the good and the bad, the righteous, the unrighteous, the close, the neighbors, the enemies. Everyone benefits from this constant flow of generosity from God that is the love that Jesus reveals to us. That's what agape means. That's the word. And we, we use it fairly casually, but it carries with it a huge charge and a huge responsibility. It is not natural. That kind of love is contrary to every instinct. It's beyond our ability without God's help, and that is why Jesus moves us on and says, you need to do this kind of love so that you can be real children of your heavenly Father. That's why he gives that one final instruction that I also wish wasn't really there, the one that says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word that comes and translates in most English Bibles as perfect really means in Greek, not perfect the way we think of it, but it means complete, fulfilled, meeting the expectations of why something was created or put there or bought. And for us, it means being fully human beings, fully men and fully women, full children of the Father, the lovers of the world who love it the same way God does. That's what perfection is. That's what we see in Jesus Christ, who is so perfect that in the throes of death, he can look out with love and say, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. That's love, and that's what we're called to. And it isn't easy, is it? It's not where we would like to be. There are enemies in our lives. We've all had people who have wished us and done us harm. And that is a case to itself and not one to be trivialized. But I think that many of the things that we find difficult to love and that we resist loving in our life are not caused by enemies, but are really caused by people who are simply different than we are. It is so true that we can love those who are around us, that we can love our families, we can love people who love us. That doesn't cost anything. But when we begin to try to examine why it is that we find people difficult to love, I think it has more to do with the fact that they are different than we are than we want to admit. And I'll give you two examples. 
In our beloved Episcopal Church for the last 40 or so years, our church has been wrestling with issues that have created tremendous controversy, going all the way back into the 60s, right up to the present. And the way we have dealt with those is legislative. We've dealt with them in our general convention, and we've had motions, and we've changed rules, and we've had things passed and things voted down, and our church has become something of a divided church along the lines of winners and losers, neighbors and enemies. And what we've done in doing that, and I accuse myself here of this because I spent a good 10 years of my ministry working in church politics and going to conferences that Bishop Pope used to say, we've got to go try to save the church again. Well, it didn't work. <laughs> but we tried. We thought we were doing the right thing. But I know that I have so often lost sight of the fact that the people who are my adversaries in some of those great battles over things that we truly are passionate about and that we believe are not my enemies. They're brothers and sisters in Christ who are different in the way they see things than I do. And that makes it possible when you admit that, then you can begin to pray for those who are different than you are and any temptation to hate will fade away. You can't pray for someone that God will love them and that you will love them and maintain that hatred. I used to see when I was doing that kind of traveling and, and politicking years ago, before I had good sense and got back to parish life, where there are no, per, there are no politics in parish life. <laughs> I used to go to England several times a year, and I would frequently get to go to the General Synod of the Church of England, which is like our General Convention. It's very different, in fact, but it's the same function. And I used to watch the bishops on the floor of the General Synod of the Church of England argue passionately about some of the same issues that we were facing in the United States. But at lunchtime at a General Convention, the two sides will disappear and they will caucus and they will talk and they will plan how to continue the assault in the afternoon. <laughs> at lunchtime at the General Synod of the Church of England, the bishops who had been rhetorically at each other's throats all morning would usually go and sit down and have a pint of beer together and talk about their families and their friendships and their diocese, and then the bell would ring, time to go back in, and the fight was on again. <laughs> They, they had not lost sight of the fact that they were brothers and sisters in Christ with different points of view. And I fear that much of our life in the Episcopal Church has been winners, losers, neighbors, and enemies. And we are, in fact, not enemies, but we are different. But we're united in Christ. And we're terribly far off when we drift towards anything that even looks slightly like hatred for each other. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Second example, and this one is closer to home and current. If you do not think that there is a shortage of this kind of love and respect in the world, I would invite you to choose the news outlet of your choosing, the one that you like best, and watch it on any day, this week or the next, and listen to how our politicians talk about each other. And then you'll see that there is a great deal of strong, unbounded love that is needed in this world to help us see that people who hold a different view of politics are still united to one another by being children of God, by being citizens of this country, by being whatever it is that holds us together and makes us needing to speak passionately, but not as one enemy to another, but as friends who share something in common and love it. Those two things, you can test yourself and see where you are in how you regard people who are different and how you regard those who are genuinely your enemies. But there's nothing to be gained by only loving those who love you. There's nothing to be gained by only greeting those who will greet you back. 
What good is that, says the gospel reading? But actually loving those who are different and going so far as to love your enemies with the love that speaks from the cross and says, Father, forgive them, forgive us, he's saying. That would be really perfect. That would be really perfect. Amen.